Welcome to my podcast. My name is Aldo Matza, and this is Shaping Your Journey, inviting you to join me in conversations with friends, artists, professionals, and experts in the music field and our music world. Today, I have the honor and pleasure of inviting Valerie Naranjo, who has been a, not only a longtime friend, but somebody I follow with great interest because she has done so many uh, uh, interesting things besides being on the Saturday Night Live show and Lion King and all of that that we'll, we'll talk about. And we'll, we'll discuss, you know, shaping your journey from wherever you're from to wherever you, you land, whether that be temporary or it's eventually it'll be uh, the steps you have left on the planet. Valerie, thanks so much for, for joining us. Before we, before we um, uh, go into like shaping your journey, for those who may not know your like back background, the backstory of where, tell us a little about where you came from, just to, for us to contextualize, and then we can talk about about the the journey later. Well, thank you so much, Aldo. It's really a pleasure. Thank you for your patience. This is the second attempt. Uh, my uh, my parents are from. Uh, the Ute and Navajo ancestry of the Southwest, Southern Colorado. Uh, music for us and all the performing arts has been uh, a way to live a better life. And I really say uh, my parents were my first great mentors about, uh, about being an artist. Um, I am on the, uh, this is my 28th season at Saturday Night Live. Wow. Uh, I am a resident of New York City, and also I jump away from New York City to my home here upstate New York in the Northern Catskills. Um, also involves the Lion King on Broadway. And my uh, the thing that really floats my boat, especially these days, is my involvement with um, my program at New York University, um, West African drum, percussion, dance, song and um geo this instrument behind me nice. um, that's that's it in a nutshell but what uh, so tell me i mean you you were um from this environment but um and, and it's great to be uh, supported in, in a musical situation why new york i went for, i transferred from the university of colorado which was now, I'm from Colorado. It just made sense to go there. Uh, had the stellar, amazing, my hero, John Gaum. Dr. John Gaum was the head of the department there. Uh, I transferred my second year uh, to the University of Oklahoma, a place I knew nothing about. While I was at the University of Oklahoma, being very, very nurtured as a musician, uh, thanks all you people, who, all the amazing teachers I had, at the University of Oklahoma as well, um, I met the wonderful Lee Howard Stevens. And when I first heard Lee play, I said, okay, the marimba is much, much broader, much more expressive, much more technical, uh, a, a much more complete instrument than I had ever realized. Uh, Lee spent a week with us at University of Oklahoma and at the end of the week, I said, Lee, I, I have to continue this. How can I do it? And he, in told, he, in, he told me where he lived in Manhattan. And I said, I'll see you there. That might have been a March or an April. And by the end of June, I had moved there. Thought, OK, uh, I, I also had been mentored uh, through the Visiting Artist Program at OU by Gordon Stout, another of uh. my great, great heroes. Um, and I thought to myself, well, I'll spend the summer in New York City. I'll go and do graduate school with Gordon Stout. Of course, I had to jump all the hoops. And thank you, Gordon, for, for allowing me to be in your program. Uh, I thought, well, perhaps I move back to New York for a summer and then, I don't know, to Wisconsin or San Diego or uh, Utah. Uh, but my thirst 18 hours in new york city i met the great musician and my husband barry olson and that changed my trajectory completely uh 
And and I thought, yes, uh, a year or a few months in New York has turned into many, many years. And I love it still to this day. Uh, so much being in that this that wonderful environment of New York City. Sure, it's truly, it, it's, I mean, it's an energy, that's for sure. I spent a lot of time in New York because while I was in, um, uh, in stud studying at McGill, I used to go to New York every month to study with various people. Oh, my goodness. So, oh, yeah, because my whole idea originally was to move to New York. So I would do my bachelor's and then move to New York because I wanted to be a studio musician, right? So I was mm -hmm. meeting everybody. I was hanging out with Steve Gadd, and uh, David Friedman would take me to sessions, uh, uh, Lou Marini. I mean, all kinds of people would introduce me to people. And so I was kind of in the long run setting up for this. I mean, of course, I got too busy in Montreal and then repercussion and then everything else. And they said, that project will never happen. So I'll just do it from here. <laughs> and such an amazing project repercussion is. And, you know, you... You've, you've shaped our world, and I, I thank you for that. My, uh, my first uh, experiences in New York were, so to speak, from the back door. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, here I was studying with Lee Stevens, and it was such an honor, such a pleasure. I felt like my whole life was going like that every single time I met with him. Uh, so that was very exciting. Most, most exciting for me, too, though, was the introduction or the reintroduction to jazz. Uh, Barry's an incredible jazz trombonist, percussionist, and pianist. Right. And so he had me going to jazz clubs all over the place, and I began to understand the marimba as an improvising instrument. Now, back when I was a freshman at the University of Colorado, um, there was a doctoral student from Ghana, and um, Joseph was a clarinetist and he was studying music theory. He was a thorough classicist, but he used to come and teach us uh, because of Dr. Gom's uh, mentorship. He wanted world music before it became a term to be part of our percussion palette, a big part of it. And so uh, Joseph used to teach Eve drumming to us. And, you know, that's the first time I realized that having a groove and having technique are not necessarily the same thing. And it was a big eye opener for me at a very young age. But the thing about Joseph, he used to walk up to a marimba, you know, the four and a third musser, and he'd play things, he kind of noodled around on it. And I immediately would think, wow, this man knows something very deep that no one else I've ever met in my life knows. You know, my father used to take us to, um, different Native American places, different Native American communities, both North and South. And uh, he used to be fond of going to Northern Mexico, where the Chuch people would play the, the Mexican marimba. And with I used the, to think, the buzzes, a, right. oh, man, uh, what a beautiful sound. That's the first thing that struck me. The timbre of this instrument is so sweet. Um, and, and I also... You know, at the same time growing up, I had a cousin who was a drummer and, and he was my hero because I love drums. Anything to do with drums. I, I started drumming in the school band when I was about nine years old. So and I had actually my first two band directors were drummers, were, were kit players and, and talented ones. So here we had uh, my father taking me around to see other marimbas and other Native Americans. Uh, my cousin Tommy introducing me to Earth, Wind, and Fire, uh, Tower of Power, uh, Carlos Santana. And I thought to myself, I, these, these two things, I wonder if they were put together, what they'd be like. Now, I didn't know a lot at that age. And then eventually through, um, through Joseph at the University of Colorado, I said, aha. What he has is a connection, and I want to know more. Joseph, how did you learn how to play like this? He said, I don't know. I, I don't play this. I, I play clarinet. I said, <laughs> Joseph, you're, you're on to something. And he told me about the deal. Yeah. And that was enough to get me started.
Yeah, and also, I mean, these African masters who who they don't they don't realize how deep all that music is that they bring to the table. I I had the the pleasure of working with Ab Abraham Adzinya from Ghana. You know, with repercussion, we did three or four concerts with him, and so he we we had already studied music of of Western Africa, but mainly Ivory Coast and um, Guinea, and so it was mainly djembe playing and dundums. And when we met Abraham, it was like a whole different world. And I said, how could that be in Africa? These are completely different worlds. It's like moon and sun, like not, even, not related whatsoever. But their cultures were so deep that it, it was just amazing. And I, I could see where you can get inspired so much. And it, with the GLL, some people know, know that as a balafone. But you've, done, you've taken this to a, to a whole other level and brought it to... Uh, context. I mean, I've watched you at PASIC. I've watched you uh, also when you came to COSA. I mean, you you had that. as, And also when we did the COSA New York with you and, and Jonathan Haas at NYU. And you're doing... Yeah, I remember that. That was really, really special. And COSA for me has been just... Um, you know, I've done a, a fair amount of uh, symposia. And COSA for me was the opportunity to just let go. And it takes a special kind of, um, you know, in Japan, in, in Japanese, they, they have a saying, cho no ichinen, means the energy of the leader or the energy of the person in charge is going to be the energy of the entire project or situation. And, and I thank you for that, because Kosa is just one of my fondest memories. I really feel great about that. I'm so happy that you had the chance to work with Abraham. Uh, I, I knew Abraham briefly. He taught at Wesleyan and yes, and such a master, such an amazing, uh, an amazing master of percussion. And, and you're right, Aldo. Um, I, it just brings to mind uh, mentors like people like a gentleman named Baere Yotere or a gentleman named Chitare. Chitare Yardide. They are such amazing players and they, first of all, it's musicianship and technique in this culture in the Upper West of Ghana and uh, Burkina Faso and Cote d'Ivoire and as well as the rest of West Africa, certainly, and, and arguably the rest of the, of the continent. Uh, I've only been to 10 African countries, so I can't speak for all of Africa. Um, but I can speak for Madagascar, and that's one of the wow. places that is so, so special to me, as well as, as the other South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe, and uh, the West African countries I've been to. But it's taken for granted, you know, music is a language. So I, I kind of liken it to when we were children, when we were tiny, you know, um, no one ever said, when you said apple, your mom didn't say, no, it's apple. You know, your mom was like, oh, look, daddy, she's talking. And that's the kind of joy and excitement that comes with the, the, uh, the African art, be it dance, song, uh, the amazing instruments, so many of them you can't count, including the right. jeel and all the drums and percussion and the stringed instruments, the, the lutes, the lyres, all of those amazing instruments um, that are played with such complexity. You talk to someone, especially in the rural areas, and they say, yeah, it, it, you think it's complex? Well, it's, they, they, they use language akin to the language we, we talk about when we're learning language per se sure sure yes it's something we acquire something we're proud of it's something that serves us raises our life condition but they don't realize oftentimes how incredibly special they are and i had a similar experience when i was a kid um i grew up in a town in southern colorado that was integrated uh but but segregated at the same time and i felt like Oftentimes, the, the gifts of Native peoples was not being recognized. 
And the people who had those gifts, in my experience, were, were very kind and humble. And so they didn't stand up and say, hey, recognize my gift. They just said, well, you know, rightfully so. If my gift serves someone, then it's fine. Uh, but I felt that was a little bit, something was a little bit wrong with that. And so I've, I've been kind of on that path to, to, uh, to speak for the underdog, so to speak. And it's, and it's interesting. I mean, getting back to the, the idea of music and music as a language and as a culture and, and, and a general, like casting out the big net. Um, you know, I strongly believe, and I, and I say it, you know, uh, music, musicians, that, that's a nation. It's a world <laughs> nation. When you think about it, Eval, think about this. I mean, we understand this language. Anybody on the planet, no matter what the language, what the cultural background, whatever, religion, it doesn't matter. We understand this language. So we're like a, a nation on the planet. Isn't that, isn't that an interesting isn't idea? That yeah. No, no, when you think about it, you say, incredible. How many languages do you speak? Well, I speak this one too. I mean, I happen to speak four. Well, actually five. Actually, six because Calabrese, where I where I was born, is a language. It's it's not just a, a derivative. It is a language, but mm -hmm. the language of music. You can go anywhere uh, on the planet, and people will understand. And I had the. It's funny. You just made me think of this thing, uh, a native thing. A friend of mine in New York, a couple of years ago, asked me, a big uh, an Italian association. He said, "I I want to make a gift." To a very good friend of mine who are from is from the First Nations, just with an apology about Christopher Columbus coming over, and you know now we're here we are. And I said, well, first of all, Christopher Columbus never foot never set foot actually in North America. It was all the islands, mm -hmm. and the Italians they they had nothing to do with any of this craziness. The Italians just brought things to the world, including great food. But I said, I, I get where you're coming from, and I think it's a great idea. So then I thought, rather than, uh, I mean, what kind of gift could you offer? So he said, can you write something? So I, I said, let me think about it. I, you just gave me an idea. So what I did, Valerie, is um, I took some Cree music and chant, okay? And I'm listening to it. And I said, this is exactly what the Tarantella, in, in, where I'm ah. from, is. The chants, the, the, the singing, the pulse is the same. The, the, this triplet that can go over. So I superimposed it. So I composed this thing that goes in and out from the N Native American Cree uh, chants and, and some of the, the drumming mm -hmm. around the table uh, to the Italian Tarantella playing and I play the, the the tamborello and I had some of the the drumming in there and I composed some other stuff that I recorded and I chanted in this <laughs> so I sent it to him and I said it's superimposed and it works it's it's one you know mm -hmm. it's so he f he flipped and of course he he gave this as a gift and and I did the same thing with with Cuban by the way with rumba with Cuba, uh, rumba and tarantella, and I superimposed and I added some things and made it work. I said, "This is music. This is the language. This is the culture of, of of the the music nation of the planet." And those of us who are fortunate enough to to be part of it would we'll, we'll get it if we listen closely enough. To me, it works. And I think you know, as you say, musicians as musicians and and artists in general, we have big, you know. We listen with a different ear, perhaps, and we certainly appreciate uh, art on, on such a high level. Uh, but what you just said reminded me of a, a really amazing artist named Tuli Dumakude from South Africa. And I was um, actually, Tuli introduced me to South Africa, first of all, because of her art. And then during the time that I was performing with Tuli in, in New York, I felt like I really owed it to myself to travel to South Africa. And this was just after my first journey to Ghana, which was in 1988. So in 1988 and, eight, uh, 88 and 89, and then in 1990, I said, you know, I've been playing this music with Thule. I need to go. 
But before that, when I met Tuli, she had, um, we, we met on uh, a piece that was directed by Julie Taymor, who's the director of The Lion King. And we were sitting side by side at the, you know, in the dressing room. So we had our dressing table with the mirror and things. And we took our street clothes and put our costumes on. And one day she wore Zulu necklaces. And I, they were beautiful. And I said, ah, Tuli, have you traveled to the land of the Zuni? Because you have Zuni necklaces. You know, Zuni is from the Southwest. And she said, oh, yeah, these are Zulu. I said, yeah, Zuni. She thought I was mispronouncing Zulu. And I thought she was mispronouncing Zuni. But the art was exactly the same. Wow, beautiful. So Tuli, uh, then uh, in 1990, I went to South Africa, toured from there to Botswana to Zimbabwe, and just learned so many amazing things. But one thing, the, the greatest thing I learned uh, was told to me by a uh, South African on the airplane as I was traveling there. She said, you know, if we were left alone, and we weren't dominated, you would find that we're just people and we understand that we bleed, we, we pain, we have joy, we express in a very similar manner. And this yes. I found um, in South Africa, just such, such an amazing melding of the European and the native experience there. And well, fortunately, that year, uh, Nelson Mandela was released from prison. He did a tour of the United States. I was able to uh, perform at one of those at City College. And then I met uh, the wonderful Zim Kawana. And that's another story. But just to say that, um, you know, we are, we're more, we're more similar as, as human beings than, than we think. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. There's no, there's no question there. I mean, the, I mean, we're we're designed how we were created. I mean, to me, it's always a mystery how things actually work. You know, just look <laughs> at your finger. You know, I tell even my students, I said, you know, we were designed to play drums. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I look. I yes. mean, yes. This thing here is a drummer. <laughs> yes, and that this, I mean, you know, those who play traditional, you have, you use this axis, right? In here, yes. Or and, and all of the holding the, the, the mallets, and, and it's amazing. And of course, I get funny looks, but I say, you know, how is it that everybody has the same format, same everything, and things just work? It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, tell me more about, about Cuba, because you have spent a long time in Cuba. I spent many years longing to go to Cuba. And then all of a sudden, bing, bang, bash, um, through my association with Dr. Andy Tierstein at the Tiersch School of Performing Arts, which is where, not where I teach. I teach in a different school at New York University. But Andy and I had done something many years before, and he invited me to the Global Institute of Advanced Studies. And through that, we went to Cuba three times, and it was such a mecca. Oh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the three journeys were brief. You know, they were two, three weeks each. But you've spent a lot, a lot of time in Cuba, and I, well, I just find it interesting to. Well, it's about twenty-three years know. that I've been going seven, eight wow. times a year. About the same amount of time I've been going to Ghana. Yeah, and and it, it I mean, to me, it was fascinating just because. When I, I first got there and I s met people like Geraldo Piloto and uh, all of these people who were there doing incredible things, I, you know, then I, I dug a little bit deeper and saw that, you know, what this country was able to do with, with nothing, but just with an idea, like mm. uh, education and culture and health. Those are the three investments they made in that, in that country. And and the music they were the conservatories they study classical, and the rest that has been developed. You're talking about a musical continent. You know, at first you don't have this idea, and and you know, as percussionists we study this music, but then all of a sudden you're in this context, and all of a sudden everything you knew you have to completely put aside. You say, 
now I understand, but I'm, I'm beginning to understand what is going on here. And we have it all wrong. We're not understanding anything. So you have, I wanted to get to the backside and start learning and explaining. So I would, we'd be bringing groups down. We'd have the La Fiesta del Tambor with uh, Giraldo Piloto and all the, all the great artists in Cuba. So we're, we've been working together for, for the last over 23 years. And now we started a second project in Matanzas, the Matanzas Jazz Festival. So we have all the rumba wow. groups like that are that are resident there. They they're just on the streets. They're everywhere. So, and and the the interesting thing is we have a musicologist that I always engage whenever we bring a, a group down or we do a, a program, uh, Dr. Olavo, who's an ethnomusicologist, and he he explains because I said, you know, when you go to the Oriente, Matanzas, Havana or anywhere on the island, it's, it's a musical continent with different roots, different lineages. It's not all one music. Mm -hmm. um, rumba has nothing to do with son. Um, and I, you know, I can go on and on. And it's, you have to understand these different lineages that have absolutely nothing to do with the other. And you have a country where congas were born, bongos were born, timbales were born, and the techniques along with them were created, which are totally different from anything else. The only thing that resembles timbales, of course, is a descendant of the timpani. You know, so you have the sticks and the kind of the French, French way of playing light, generally speaking. But the timbales, which is timbal in French, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the whole lineage. And how did that develop? And that had absolutely nothing to do with Afro-Cuban. You can't call all Cuban Afro-Cuban. It's not. Some of it is <laughs> that uh -huh. lineage. Other is um, uh, uh, from Spain, from France, from the rest of Europe, from other sources. And, and I've had these conversations where you get exasperated because you, you see so much and, it, and it's like different lineages and I said to, I remember once saying to Horacio Hernandez, who now is back in Havana, he's living there. Yeah. I said, Horacio, I see the African, I see the, he says, listen, I go five kilometers and I don't recognize some of the rhythms. It's just incredible. And so at one point, <laughs> when, when you're bringing people down who have our limited knowledge, and I'm like a few steps ahead because I've been there so long, uh, they ask certain questions, and and I have to clarify, and and justify certain things. Ju why we learn this? Because the guys will look at me, and, and and then I ask. I see through their eyes that they don't really understand the question, because our questions are not like what should be asked, because they don't know. We, you know, the three two. What what is three two two three? For example, that's our invention. It's, <laughs> they don't think in those terms. And you can move the clave over. So when you, you don't start on, if it's a 3-2 clave, um, it's not like three notes in the first bar, two notes in the second. Well, if, it's, if you start on, like if you think of the three side, and the end of four is actually the first note. So instead of pa, 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 you start on the three side, but that third note, so pa, 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 pa. So where was one? <laughs> exactly the same thing you find in West Africa. And, exactly, you know, it's, yes. It's very difficult for me to explain at times to people who go with me to study that it is very linguistic. First of all, West Africans, they don't count. One, two, ready, go. Mm -mm, there's none of that. No, you it's know, the call. Um, it's the calls, right? And it's and it's a, it's a cyclical. You know, the music is also is 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 also in a cycle. So you jump in. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, having three students in twenty. I think it was twenty eighteen, who went with me, and you know we were studying a. Well, we would consider in America a fairly simple drumming pattern called fume fume, uh, which is from uh, the upper from the from the upper east and gone down to the uh, Accra vicinity of Ghana. Right. 
And when they studied with a member of the National Dance Company, because I said, you've got to study with the best, we all we all arrived. They were very cool. Uh, as an aside, the first thing we said is, well, how are we going to pay you? They're not concerned with that. They say, open your heart. They say, from your heart. That's a common. So we had, to, we had to get together and say, okay, how much can we, what can we give back? I have a story about giving back that I'll, we'll talk about later. But um, we arranged all of that. And then um, this teacher said, okay, guys, we're going to study Fume Fume for a week. And the students were, what? It's a very simple back, boogoo, back, boogoo, boom, da 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 kung kung, kick, 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 kung, kick, 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 kung, kick, 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 kung, kung. Why are we going to study that for a week? This, this is what they were asking me. Ask him, why are we studying this for a week? You know, they were, uh, they were dumbfounded to know how deep a simple statement of rhythm can be. The songs, the dance movements, the language associated with it. But um, so, yes, just the whole way of thinking about music, I think, that comes from uh, places like Cuba, Brazil, Ghana. Um, it has a lot to teach us. Oh, all huge, of us, huge. Who, who live, who, you know, we, who, we kind of learn in a linear fashion and we learn in a way that says, okay, what's first? What's second? That's how we even count our, our measures. I remember uh, when I studied with the great Kakraba Lobi, who was the founding uh, Jill master of the National Dance Company of Ghana back in, you know, way back when it began. He taught me something that was very, very, two things, very, very complicated things right when I began to study with him. And then I realized after some months and, and weeks that the things that followed were not as complicated. And I finally asked him, Kakraba, why did you start with Pire and Dark Fo? these two very complicated things. And he said, well, you know, here, we don't start with what's easy. We start with what's most important. Ah. <laughs> yeah. And, and in, his, uh, in his way of thinking, how to greet the instrument was of utmost importance. You know, we never, in our common Western way, we never walk up to someone we haven't seen in a week and just start doing our business. We say something. We say, ah, oh, nice to see you. Hello. You know, we greet each other. We, sure. we, we join in a greeting. We get in each other's common space. And Pire is a musical way to do that. And also to show um, where you come from. You know, among among West Africans, where you come from, where things come from, that's very, very important. And for me, it, it offers a big, big lesson on how to live. Sure. Yeah. One of those lessons is how is to know where things come from. Know sure. where I come from, know where this this chair comes from, know where this geo comes from you know, both in terms of physically and its history. Uh, and they say very, very, very keen to the point that the ancestry is part of the experience. Yeah. And uh, to me, every time I go there, I'm reminded of how to be the happiest person I can be. Yeah. I mean, you make me uh, think about it. I mean, we kind of do it, those of us who are sensitive to these things. I mean, I do it instinctively because you kind of setting not the stage, but the context of your conversation. Because if you don't know anything about the person, if you don't know their background, what's important to them, what's around them, how can you have a real conversation unless you're, you're just counting numbers and, and you know, saying, I'll, I'll buy that piano, I'll buy that drum, and I'll see you tomorrow. But to have a real mm -hmm. conversation where you're dealing, like, for example, you, I mean, if we're having this conversation, I have to know what you've done, what you, what's around you, what's important to you. Otherwise, what I say may may not land anywhere or may not be of interest. It's not a conversation in that case. And the same mm -hmm. vice versa. You know, like you're, you're, you're setting, um, 
how should I say, what's the right word? Not a, not a stage, a, a kind of the parameters of where, where we are. The parameters could be small or could be, could be huge, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, this is what I'm thinking. This is I do I, it instinctively. I agree. I agree. And just the the power of uh, the power of conversation, the art of conversation, is. Uh, I think we in the West we need more of that art. Sure, sure. Uh, and that's you know one of the things I I hope to uh, to pass on, you know. Well, you do it all the time uh, in, naturally. In, I my, mean. in my life, is yes. to teach other people and to engage in conversation, real dialogue. I think yep. in, rooted in real dialogue are the solutions to many of our life's problems. Yep. Not all of them. Well, no, no, of course. But I mean, we're, as, I mean, as musicians, as artists, I mean, we're consumed and concerned with the... Uh, you know, with the art of, how should I say it, um, resolve, right? Uh-huh. Uh, re resolving um, problems. When I say problems, I mean, I'm talking about um, you have to play in time, you have to play in, in rhythm, you have to be in sync, you have to be not louder, not softer, it has to be the right space so it has to it has to work right mm -hmm. and so we're always finding and working on solution you never really look at the problem because the, the you know the problem is if you're not in time you quickly find that solution so our mindset is 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 built such that we're always looking for that solution so it makes us perfect for these kinds of situations as resolvers and not problem creators <laughs> I, it, it kind of reminds me the way uh some of the structure of west african music is how to answer the question you know in conversation you pose a question hey do you like bananas i like bananas what are your favorite uh dishes oh i like creme brulee with banana topping you know so this this engages these kind of um these kind of conversations engage us to learn more oh i don't know how to make creme brulee tell me how um and and in 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 west african music it is really about posing a musical idea i'll say and then providing more information to to make that idea blossom um, in 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 English, you would say, for example, how are, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling small, small hungry. Small, small <laughs> hungry. Ah, you didn't have breakfast. No, I didn't have breakfast. So you notice I'm answering my question with part of the answer. So we don't just briefly say, how are you? Ah, a bit hungry. You know, it's the art of making the sounds. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah. What was your morning like? I planted daisies. I love daisies. Just the the, the sound of daisy. You know, in in uh, West African conversation, the sound of uh, amasi. It's a beautiful uh, dish. I like Amasi. I remember a South African once telling me about Amasi. Amasi, you will love Amasi. But just the pronunciation of that beautiful nice. word uh, <laughs> became an item. Beca and and this is the structure of 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 music as I as I know it in West Africa, uh, in in all, really all all around the world. Um, but in especially in my situation, um, how that plays out in our culture in terms of jazz, um, R and B, um, pop things, the kind of things I do with the Saturday Night Live band and you know other wonderful uh, indie bands that I've you know had the opportunity to play with. Um, those those same kind of principles are are at play. You know, I, have a, uh, I have a question. I just thinking came across my mind. What was first, Lion King or Saturday Night Live? Saturday Night Live. 
Okay. And so how did that how did that thinking. how did that come about? First of all, like you're in New York and somebody invited you to to the join the band? Um I'll try to make it brief because it's a very long story, but it's, 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 uh, I'll make it as brief as I can. I used to busk on the street, okay. play uh, muster four and a third octave marimba. Nice. One day I said, you know, I was in front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art where lots of money is flowing. And I just said, you know, I want to go somewhere where the people are. You know, there are people everywhere, of course, but where people might not be able to... Uh, put as much money in my tray, but they will appreciate this. So I went to the Lower East Side and I played in front of a church on, I think it was on First, uh, First Street. And a car came driving by, stopped. Woman came out of the car, ran to me like really fast. I said, she's going to steal my money. No, she said, ah, my name is Consuelo. We are in a hurry. We need a marimba player. Give me your card. I'm going to call you later. She called within, you know, within a week. El Taller Latino Americano of New York, uh, led by the legendary Argentine Bernardo Palombo. Okay. Uh, asked me to do a, a misa called Misa Campesina at the Church of St. John the Divine, the largest <laughs> Gothic cathedral in the world. I know the, the church. Said, yeah. I am on. I really uh, had a beautiful relationship with El Tayer, which I keep to this day. Um, and I became a member of the house band. When you're a member of the house band, if someone comes and they can pay you $1,000 to back them, you smile and you say, yes, and you make great music. If someone comes and they don't have a penny, you smile and you make great music. That's just the way the house band worked. And uh, I played with a wonderful Chico da Costa from uh, Paraguay, and Philip Glass was in the audience. Philip was actually supporting Chico. And about a day later, I got a call, and they said, we're doing a new piece called po uh, Poacazzi. Would you like to audition to, to record it? And uh, I went to their uh, living room studios. It's called The Living Room. And what they needed to know was, could I follow a click track and could I read? So fortunately for me, I had began a wonderful career of 12 years with the Philip Glass Ensemble. Beautiful. When I was with Philip Glass making that recording, I met the wonderful Roger Squitero, who knew Lenny Pickett of Saturday Night Live. And Roger said, you know, um, Nanny's looking for a mallet player. You play mallets, don't you? And I said, yeah, that's really my favorite thing to play. And he said, um, I have to get you in touch with Lenny. Meanwhile, I walk from a off off Broadway show to uh, Drummer's World, where uh, where uh, Mr. Greenspun, uh, Barry Greenspun. You know what a beautiful place! Not only was it a great place with lots of instruments, but it's a place where people met. Sure, I know the place. I remember it. Yes. Yes. It was just a, such oh. a beautiful place, wasn't it? You find yeah. the most unusual instruments. He was crazy. Oh. And he would always call you over and says, Aldo, check this out. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and, That's how I bought so many instruments. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, who was standing there but Lenny Pickett? And I said, oh, I, I think I know this face. Oh, my gosh, it's Lenny Pickett. And I said, oh, hello. And he said, oh. It's very interesting that you show up right now because Roger and I were trying to get your phone number and you're not in the union book. So we couldn't find you. And here you are. And at the end of the conversation, um, Lenny said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, the music mesa in Frankfurt. Could you come? And, and I said, oh, wow. Oh, my heart, right? And I said, I'd be delighted to go. Um, and he told me how much it paid and he apologized. And I said, wow, that's that's more of an income than I've had ever. <laughs> but I said, oh, that's okay. And we did the music mesa and we had a wonderful time. And then I began to play with Lenny. He had an art band called the Borneo Horns. Uh, I couldn't do a particular tour, so I, I sent Bill Ware. I don't know, Bill Ware is the most amazing vibraphonist, just an amazing man, too. And I said to myself, 
I think I've subbed myself out. In other words, when you send a sub who has skills that you might not have, they might go with that person. And I didn't hear from Lenny for over a year. So I thought, ah, I've subbed myself out. Okay, that's fun. The next I heard from Lenny was um, 1995, August, on my answering machine. Remember those? Oh, yes. I still have, <laughs> I still have the original one that I bought in New York. It's a reel-to-reel -reel answering machine. Oh 19, my goodness. 1976. I, I have it just as a museum piece. Memorabilia. <laughs> well, I had the cassette. And um, and I had just been through quite a summer, but 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 here was the here was the, the message that was on my machine. Valerie, all summer long we have been struggling to get you in the Saturday Night Live band. And wow. yesterday we broke through. And what was happening at the time uh, was uh, there was a drop in the ratings. They were going to drop the show. They wanted to spruce the show up. He, he thought to himself, percussionists would do the best thing for the band. But the, the, uh, you know, the folks with the money said, no, we, we're downsizing. We're not upsizing. No, we can't do that. So they just kept going back and forth. And anyway, he said on, on my machine, uh, we just broke through. Uh, and by the way, Barry, uh, if Valerie's out of town, uh, please call me back and let me know because we'll have to pass on her because we have to do this right now. Well, you know, I was supposed to be out of town, but somehow I was not. Somehow that that flipped around and I was in town and the rest is history. Yeah. You know, this that's, is in interesting, Valerie. It. This is this is super interesting. And I, and I have to say this because I'm, I'm and I tell everybody, I don't believe in coincidences. You know, things that happen are opportunities and you choose to be there or not to, to go in or out, show up or not. But those opportunities are there. And if you're if you show up is there and then you know what to do or not to do. No such thing as a coincidence. <laughs> oh, absolutely not. No, I, I feel Beautiful. like. We have uh, each of us, whether, you know, we're a teacher, we're a cook, um, we design clothing, we clean houses. We each have a, a very special thing for our community. And I think, as you say, Aldo, half of it is just having the courage to show up. Absolutely. And you always, I mean, you have to be ready, but you got to show up. And, and yeah. <laughs> and and be ready. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, right? and for me, showing up to Saturday Night Live, I was petrified. I, I was petrified. You know, here you have Steve Touré and Sean Pelton and Leon Pendarvis and Lenny. I'm like, oh my god, ooh, ooh. And the you know the first um, they planned very carefully the first band shot. I was brought under probation. In other words, they wanted to see if it would work. Nice. And so my first three um, episodes were under probation, and then they would decide whether the percussion chair was something that was, was supposed to be added. And it's live so too, right? To the, so. Yeah, it was, I was supposed to be the person to, to be in it. Um, Cheryl Hardwick, who was one of our directors, amazing pianist and amazing composer, um, she and Leon, we're trying to plan Leanne Pandarvis, amazing composer, amazing arranger. You hear Aretha Franklin, all those strings and those orchestra things are Leon. They were like, well, the first band shot has to have a big punch. You know, that way we can have our, you know, we can have Valerie in the band. And uh, they wanted to bring a vibe, a set of vibes. And they realized Paul Simon had just been there. And, you know, Paul had five percussionists. And yes. they said, hmm, that was a technically tough show because of all the mic placements. And they said, no, vibes is not the right thing because it's it, you have to carry it onto the bandstand. You have to set the mics. No, 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 we can't do something like that. And Cheryl called me and said, Valerie, um, here's what we're thinking. Um, Shekere is an instrument that is lively. Um, you, can, you, can take, you can take shots from far away. You can take close shots. And I think it's the perfect thing for your first band shot. Do you play Shekere? I did not. <laughs> and for one second, that one second felt like a minute. I had to say, okay, what do I do here? And I said, Cheryl, of course I play Shekere. She said, good. Your first band shot's gonna be um, a cover of the band, the, the group, the band. 
playing Life is a Carnival and you're going to play Shikari. Well, you know, I said, great. I put down the phone and I picked it back up and I called um, Taye Jiro, who's my favorite, one of my favorite Shikari players. And I said, Taye, you've got to help me. <laughs> and she actually arranged a lesson for me the next afternoon. Yeah. And I, I studied with the wonderful Madeline Yayodela Nelson. May God rest her soul. Um, and other Shikari players um, for five weeks. I had five weeks to get it together. Wow. And uh, I was sweating. I, I was sweating blood, I think, when I did that first band shot. And, uh, you know, between dress and air, uh, the directors of all the departments, they have a little powwow and they look at everything and they say, for example, the uh, the costumes for this piece, they're not ready. Let's put it to next week. OK, this piece wasn't funny. Let's drop it. OK, the band looks great. The song is a little too sophisticated. Let's switch. You know, all of these things that they, the, these nice. split second decisions that they make to make the best show that they can in the least amount of time. And Cheryl came to me after the, after that meeting and she said, you looked great. And it was the first time in, in my, maybe one of the first times in my life that I realized, you know, Musician and music, in particular percussion, is very, very visual. And I started to think, oh, I have to honor that. Sure. It's not about, of course, they do put us in, in they, they, they clothe us, they put the hair, they do the makeup, they want a particular look. But it's also, um, what you give to your audience, the sincerity, and not being too cool to, to do a little bit of that, I realized, okay, that's important. And of course, having been to West Africa so many times, I, I realized that you're, 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 the way you emote and the way you, uh, the way you communicate that is, is very important. You can lift someone's day. You can lift them out of Sure. A very bad mood. You could lift them out of despair no, by no, just absolutely. saying, yeah. share what I have to give you. No, no, absolutely. And also, I mean, percussion is a very visual thing. I mean, obviously, the the, the musical part, that's a given. But the the, uh, <clears throat> the visual, and I remember we with repercussion, we went through this at one point, and we all agreed. I said, there's one reason why I will never audition for an orchestra or things like that, although we played with many orchestras as guests. But we decided early on that we hired a choreographer, uh, people with our costumes, we had a lighting person. And this is a percussion ensemble. We we're like the Pink Floyd of, of the percussion <laughs> world. And everybody, <laughs> yeah, would, would, you know, we, we got shot down all over the place. But we said, you know, this, for me, there's nothing worse than sitting in a concert for two hours and watching people behave like they're at a funeral. You know, ah. all in black, they don't like what they're doing, and they're moving, when you have percussion instruments, they're moving instruments like they're moving furniture, it takes five minutes between a piece. <laughs> you know, I said, that, that it's, that's not a concert. That's, you know, the, the, when you play, it has to be great. But it's, it's we're also, we're also there visually, and and it has to be pleasant. So we went we went crazy with this stuff, and and, and I think it's important. Bravo! This reminds me of Tura. Uh, I I I'm in love with the group named Turacunda. Yes. And uh, when they came to Sounds of Brazil in, in New York, I said I'm going to be there. Well, what I what I learned from them is something that I really try to teach uh, my ensembles, and I try to do it myself. Uh, and I'm forced to do it in many situations, including SNL. Um, they did not have downtime, and this was, you know, Sounds of Brazil is a small club with I don't know it, it, it might hold 500 people. And the stage is fairly small, but they did not drop the energy from one piece to the other. They had the choreography, if you want to say, if you want to put it that way. Um, you would finish one piece and the balafon would come 
from somewhere and you'd begin playing with a second so that, you know, I, I agree with you, Aldo, there's nothing for me. There are a few things more frustrating in the concert situation than a percussion ensemble concert where, you know, they play something and you get it and you, you're like, wow, that was, ah, oh, that just felt. And then you sit. And, and you wait. <laughs> yes. So yeah, Kuro uh taught me a, a very big lesson. And uh, I was really, really pleased uh, last uh, last year at PASIC, um, my uh, African Jill Percussion Ensemble was chosen to perform. They were actually chosen in 2020, but because of the pandemic, we, uh, we were given the choice. Do you want to go virtually in 2020, but we would prefer to you to go to go live in 2021 and uh, everyone went for the live and and i was so proud of them that they uh they had the presence of of mind and i probably had beat them with you know <laughs> the end of drum brush so many times but they, they went seamlessly from one thing to the other and Beautiful. i think um that's a big lesson to learn um i remember once playing with the zim kawana who i mentioned before who whom i met with um at the meeting in, in City College, he used to, I, uh, Barry and I both actually had the, the honor of being in his ensemble and touring South Africa and England. He never did a set list. And you I just call made, it. Uh, hey, Zim. And, and I was playing gongs, timpani, um, you know, the, the tubular bells, marimba, vibraphone, and all kinds of African percussion. So, and, I, and, and he usually put me across the back of the stage. So I'd say the first time I, I learned to ignore it eventually, but I go, Sim, you know, do you think we could have a little set list? He said, no, 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 no. I have to feel, I have to feel the audience. Then we go, you know, according to what the audience feels, then I will decide, oh my gosh. Yeah. I, yeah. I talk about choreography. <laughs> Oh yes, uh, no, I, I know. Just the spatial relationships between instruments became a very big deal in sure. his concerts. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> and speaking of PAS, I mean, you got the Hall of Fame award, also. Ah, uh, such an right? honor! And congratulations on that one. That's fantastic. Oh, but you know what? Um, you know that's Coach gave that's me a big the one. Lifetime Achievement Award, and that is another honor that I rank up there. You know, with the and, with the PAS. Uh, Hall sorry, of I just I just lost you for a second. Um, Not to worry. Um, thank you so so much. You know, it's such an honor. I watch. <laughs> I have it here in my dining room. Nice, <laughs> nice, well deserved. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you know what? Um, Gordon Stout has been a real life mentor to me. Uh, not only music, obviously he's such an amazing musician. Oh, and, yes. and I remember and was, when I went to study in graduate school, um, Barry told me, you know, the, the, the thing you need to do is be around Gordon when he's playing as much as you possibly can. And just so sit musical. and yeah. listen and watch. And it was good advice. But uh, Gordon actually called, he phoned me up and said, um, I'd like to... Uh, I'd like to nominate you. And even the thought of that was, oh my gosh, Gordon, I, I don't know, you know. And he said, no, I think I want to. Well, I found out through another means that's, that two other amazing people had nominated me already. Um, Patrick Roulette, uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful percussionist. And, um, and, and his comrade um, had nominated me already. And I was shocked. I said, wow, it's, it's really an honor. And, but you know, I, I just have to say, I, I, I feel in my heart that that honor goes to all of my teachers, you know, because I don't, I, I've, I've never had a teacher who didn't really take care of me. Sure. And, and then we have to honor these people because, I mean, they help not only shape us, but also a guide. I mean, in, in Gordon's case, uh, I mean, uh, there's marimba playing, but uh, and Lee Stevens, certainly he was one of the first people that I had met who, you know, totally 
But then also came along Gordon Stout with his Mexican dances, and he took marimba playing to it, not just, it wasn't this way, it was like this way. And everybody got inter suddenly interested in, in marimba playing as a solo instrument again, and, and fun, fun stuff, but great music. And absolutely, yeah. yeah. And it was and nice. The, I mean, the thing about Gordon too is that he was a wonderful. It was wonderful to be in his studio. He took care of each one of us, and I, I remember him telling me things like, uh, "Come over to the house for dinner. You need to take a break," because <laughs> I was really driven. I was so. Um, well, I have to say, back at that point, I used to connect music with my sense of self-worth, which is a big mistake. Um, back, uh, my first trip to Ghana, I studied with, his name was Nebun Baru, and he was a strict teacher. And I remember uh, one of the first days I was playing something uh, that he had taught me the night before, and I'd forgotten most of it. And I said, you know, I struggled and I struggled and I said, Baru, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm bad today. And he said, what? I said, I'm bad today. You know what he said? He said, you are not bad. You're a human being, and human beings are great. Hmm. And I suddenly, it was like the little light bulb that I needed to have turned on by someone that um, I I couldn't be doing the music for an, to feed my ego. You know, I either had to love this so much that I wanted to be part of the legacy or I should do something else. Sure. No, so, it makes and, total sense. And I sense. realized, yeah. yeah, I do love this and I am a very tiny part of a very big legacy. Um, so that's, that's kind of the way that I think of it these days, especially, you know, now that I pick up the crumbs this summer, I've been spending a lot of time, um, going over some of the recordings that I made even many, many years ago and realizing that I, back at the time when I was so young, I was a, kind of in a hurry to, uh, Oh, I, I learned this nicely. Can you teach me something else? You know, can you teach me something else? And, um, now I'm listening with with different ears and realizing that those crumbs, you know, when you carry a big plate of cookies that, that you know, you want it to be overloaded and you want to serve as much as you can, you know, there's going to be crumbs that fall off. Those crumbs are actually diamonds. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm learning that music or relearning it or, or revisiting it, let's say in a totally different way yep. because I'm taking more time. Yeah. And it's interesting because this whole, uh, lockdown, I mean, the whole COVID situation put us all in, in a kind of a notice. I mean, I, for myself, I mean, like most of us, we stopped suddenly, right? I mean, all these world travels, all these projects, it was like a 747 going and just stopped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then you say, okay, so we pivot to teaching online. Okay, that worked out well. But that was it. I didn't see anybody for a long time. So then you had all of this time on your hands so that you could turn your attention to other things that you'd never had time to do. Like you say, the crumbs, right? Like in our case, what, what I did, I said, all the, the 27 years or some of COSA, all the, the camps, the workshops, and all the things around the world, we film everything. So everything is documented. Let's digitize everything. And later, we'll put a whole channel of it. Repercussion ah. over, over 40 years. All these recordings we did with all these great people from Keiko Abbey to Claude Bowling to you name it. I didn't even know they existed, but I had the habit of recording and filming everything. So that's what we did here. And then I, one Man, of the other things, <laughs> it's crazy. And then I had all these inventions that I had created that I never had time to, to patent or, or go through the whole process. So I said, one by one, they're getting out the door. So one is actually being launched this year by Manhasset Music Stands. I can't say more than that right now. Oh, so, boy. I'm excited so, to find out what it is. So I'm getting all those things out the door that I, like you say, you know, all of a sudden you say, okay, now this crumb that I never paid attention to, just, I just didn't have time. There's too much other stuff I have in my head and my plate and, and with my time. And you never paid attention. Now these things are super important. 
they have a different place, right? So you're we're doing all of these things and this podcast. Now I have a chance to catch up to everybody and get the <laughs> stories out and, and have conversations that are going to be documented and are there. Finally, mm. Chris, some great stories. <laughs> oh, it's, 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 it's amazing. I mean, it, it's certainly not what any of us might have asked for. Nope. <laughs> but the chance to slow down, to be with your family, to review your life, yes. to understand appreciation, you yep. know, to go inside, all these things, you know, uh, we need to do. And, and uh, I, I, I have to say, it, it, the cloud had a very big silver lining. Yep. yep. And it, and especially for for. For you in New York, I mean, it, it must have been like the Broadway show. I mean, Lion King stopped, right? It you completely the- stopped for about, well, a year and three months. Right. That's a um, long Saturday time. Saturday Night Live did not, though. And that was a challenge. Um, I actually spent most of my time up here where I'm at now. Um, I was fortunate to be able to do that and then to go down to work. But I got to tell you, uh, SNL was... It was, for me, the proof that Lorne Michaels is a total genius because he, he, he jumped every hoop that we could actually put a show. Wow. Uh, we had um, what we called playfully the COVID police. And they were dressed in purple. And they had this six foot long, you know, the little squeegee that you use on, in the swimming pool. You put them under your arms. <laughs> they would walk around with these. And of course, um, most of the time they didn't, you know, they were just very friendly people. But they were really strict. Sure. They sure. would they would nudge you with the little squeegee to say six feet apart. You know, yeah. um, we all had individual dressing rooms before that time. We uh, the, the SNL van was crammed into a dressing room, and we used to, of course, it was. It was the great time for us to catch up because we were practically sitting on top of each other. But um, it, it felt, the sixth floor felt like a hospital ward. <laughs> That's funny. It That's was quiet. Funny. It was, you know, people were separated. And then um, the band was in two parts. Uh, the, the horn section and myself were in the old Tonight Show studio. That's thunder. Um, And the rest of the band was on the bandstand. And oh my goodness, the the idea of reaching out, just like the idea for all of us in the pandemic, you know, you had to reach out via Zoom or you had to get on the phone. I remember having a lot of conversations with my family and my students just to say, hey, um, yeah, we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. Yeah. Get yourself another mask, whatever, you know, um, send that food to the Native American nations in, in, in Window Rock or wherever. Do whatever you have to do. We're going to be fine. Yep. In the end. Yeah. And yeah, playing. And, uh, it I mean, was ba- quite an adventure for all of us, I think. But uh, and the band had to play all t- the band had to like play from different spaces. Yes. Now we're we're OK with that because we have inner ear monitors. Right. So actually, in terms of sound, even though we're all next to each other, bunched up in one, in one space, um, it's the sound. The sound is remote. So the right. sound was not a problem. Nice. Sound was fine. Yeah. Yeah. The idea of uh, Leon conducting us via the monitor, and you know, there's a split second delay. <laughs> or, you know, I used to, I realized, you know, I really like to kind of vibe with Sean because we're both playing drums. So I'm really vibing with him. And there's that, you know, on the screen, there's a split millisecond delay. Whew. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah talking, about, good- talk, talking about talking about live playing, I, I, you know, through all of this, we were all looking at ways how we could play with each other. We send each other tracks and all of this stuff. And then a friend of mine uh, turned me on to this new um, a system that they developed in Scandinavia, ELK, E-L-K, ah. which is totally live. No, if you're within 2,000 miles, 
you can play live with no delay, back and forth, not to each other, but with each other, completely. Amazing. I yeah. wrote that down. Yeah, no, look it up. I'm, I'm, I'm getting my system probably by next week that I'm going to try uh, live, and uh, I, Alan Molnar got one. So I, I got him on it, and I said, now that you have it, we can, we can do some playing totally live, mm. remotely. And I tried to do it because I'm doing this thing in, in Venice in October, and I spoke to the people in, um, in Sweden, and I said, would it be possible that I rehearse with, my, with the guys who are going to be in Italy beforehand? He says, that's a little far. If you keep it within 2,000 miles, there will be absolutely no delay guaranteed. Uh -huh. But, I mean, just think about that, though. Within 2,000 miles, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's a lot. Live. That's, <laughs> that's just amazing. Yeah, we couldn't even do it between the 6th and 8th floors. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you know, technology. I remember oh. back in, what, like 2009 when, uh, when Scott Deal was at the University of Alaska uh, developing what they called Internet 2. Right, right. Ah, yeah, so, yeah, it was... Yeah, we've, we've come a long way and it's... No, it's really, amazing. Uh, I mean, just be, being able to do this is, you know, on this it's level. Crazy. Yeah. No, no, it's crazy. such a blessing for all of us to be able to, uh, you know, go through a time of isolation with this kind of communication um, yeah. device. Yeah, and, no, and, it, it's and been a savior. And I was in, in Italy in most of July, actually for, for a month, and I was teaching from there and doing work with other people around the planet. So it really... Uh, help me understand, well, it doesn't really matter where you are. Anybody can move as long as you have the technology and you know what you're doing. It really doesn't matter. So it's fantastic. <laughs> right? yeah, I, I, it I was mean, interesting for me. Um, I, I did my first eight-hour course for the New York Open Center uh, on Native American music and its connection with West African music, eight hours on Zoom. I wow. said, oh, my gosh, is this going to fly? Is this going to work? And it Beautiful. was wonderful. We were we were really connecting as a family. Nice. Great nice. hours. You know, it's one thing to have a 20 minute meeting, you know, get the information across. But we were able to really bond uh, just, just via our our computer screen. It's really uh, it's fantastic. And now this uh, I was going to say now that I mean, all the stuff that you've done and all the great people that you've, you work with besides Philip Glass and uh, Glenn Velez, I know you, you worked with him a lot. Um, what are moving forward? What are the things that you're looking to do or in the middle of? I am, I'm, I'm kind of reassessing. Um, Good how word. Brought myself from the music into the broader, uh, spectrum um you know I, I earlier i i talked about just being from the south side of the track so to speak um i see myself uh to have the potential to you know how a good interpreter needs to needs to know both languages and so I recall, you know, when I, for example, uh, when Kakraba Lobi introduced me to a style called Goon and started to play this style, I heard Brazil, I heard Bayao, I heard Samba, I heard R&B, I heard gospel. And I would tell him, you know, this reminds me of this. And I would play these things. And he'd be delighted because he was just, he was that kind of person. Every, you know, anything he could learn. Uh, he had a childlike delight of learning. And I feel like um, he, my mentorship under his uh, guidance really opened me to the potential to bridge the gap between uh, West Africa and the United States. Um, I'm involved in, in a lot of residences, residencies. Um, and, and one that I'm particularly excited about is in Berea, Ohio, at uh, Baldwin Wallace University, where we're going to try co-writing together. It's an entire studio orchestra of young musicians. 
And we're going to explore, you know, not only a product, you know, a piece of West African music with uh, that's accompanied or or is uh, collaborated with a Western orchestra. You know, I have uh, I have a number of those pieces at, at this point, but uh, I think the process of doing this with young musicians is going to really open my eyes to the greater process, in in my opinion, of Understanding our commonality as human beings. Nice. Beautiful. Um, so if I, I, I'm still trying to define that uh, as, as a musician, you know, it's very easy, as you said before, for us musicians to, to interface. We know each other's language. We speak the language of music. Nice. Um, I, I, but I'm exploring ways to bring this uh, to the greater uh, community of humankind. I know nice. that sounds very vague. <laughs> no, no, but I, I, I personally know exactly what you mean because you get to the point where you've done, you know, how many times can you do a certain thing uh, before, you, you know, you feel the need to move f forward for several reasons. One, to give space to the other people who are coming up. You don't want to mm -hmm. occupy those spaces forever. And so we need to move on, not move on, but move forward in such a way where only you can because you've done all of these things. And uh -huh. now you can be that voice in, in a kind of a leadership where people on all sides will listen to you because you have the background and, and the capacity and the knowledge mm -hmm. to be able to. And now you can do it because certain things you don't have to do as much. And, and you, you lose, uh, well, I shouldn't say lose an appetite. You gain other appetites that I think you really need to satisfy, and I see it. I totally see it, that what you're saying. And, and, and absolutely, you should do it. you got to do yeah, it. Well, if well, you don't do you. it, nobody I, will. I, I appreciate your, your camaraderie in that. You know, for example, playing a Broadway show, you know, it's a wonderful experience. It's always, you know, um, my husband once told me, uh, you know, you have a gift that you can play something very, very corny and love doing it. Now, I'm not saying that a Broadway show is corny, no, but um, I always love playing. Just the, the act of playing is, is a gift. It's a privilege. Um, but given the choice between doing something, as you say, that I've done before and that I've enjoyed and, and broadening that to include a, uh, a new territory, for me and hopefully new territory for others who are not particularly musicians, uh, to me is exciting right now. Yep. Uh, I remember a few years ago, I taught at Lafayette College, which is a, uh, what do you call that? Uh, it's a liberal arts college. Right. And I was, uh, I was brought in by a student of mine who was a, um, she, she worked with, uh, she was in the sciences. She loved playing Jill, though. She really loved this instrument. And she uh, was part of a program where uh, freshmen, they felt that incoming freshmen did not have the writing skills that they needed to, to communicate in the world. So they allowed every freshman to do something that was completely out of their um, expertise and then to write about it. So wow. uh, Dr. Schubel was out of her expertise as a GL player, but she loved doing it. And all, all the students I had were not musicians. We had a Beautiful. blast. We made incredible music. And I felt like I broadened the net. You know, I broadened the audience, not only as people who say, oh, that's kind of interesting. I like to listen to it, but as people who had the experience Beautiful. of playing music. Yeah, um, I, I'm exploring that a lot. And of course, I'm still busy with everything I'm doing. So uh, I'm just trying to to maintain the balance of making, you know, coming out of the pandemic and making that space for what's really important in life. Yeah, no, and that's exactly. family, uh, community and uh, answering the questions that we all commonly have. Sure. And, and then be part of be part of everybody's solution and be part of you know, some a, a resource, mm. if you will. 
uh, for lack of a better word, because at, at some point people will listen to us just because we've done so much and have, have an opinion that based on years of experience or research or analysis, you know, so that we can say something and it has a certain uh, weight that brings to the table something uh, important, you know, that we can share. I, then we feel good about sharing it because finally you can, you're so committed to it that other people will, will understand. And mm. that's great. I'm glad you're doing that. I think, uh, I mean, that's, in that's some important. ways, most of us, most of us who have, have had this experience feel that too. I mean, I'm the same way. I have my own things that I'm branching out to that I, I would have never thought. And all of a sudden I have these other appetites, so exactly like what you're saying. So that's nice to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Valerie, I want to I want to say I mean we could be here forever, and but I I do want to say thank you so much for for taking the time to share with with me with us, and this will be documented for a long time. So thank you, and uh, I wish you all the best in all your projects and to be continued. Thank you, Aldo. Thank you for all that you do to uh, to be a great musician, to provide a space for musicians to to. Uh, to interface with one another through COSA, through this podcast series, through all the things that you do. Uh, you know, we, we need you. The world needs you so much. And thank you for being there for us. And I thank you. To be continued. Yes. Yes, indeed. We'll check in with each other. <laughs> yes. Yes.